I think it's fair to say that children identify more with natural phenomena than adults do. Where, for example, an adult might typically see religious symbols during a near-death experience, children very frequently encounter animals. Chris Eggleston's honeybee, for example. In addition, children themselves are often identified with small creatures, such as the monarch butterfly in the following story. The monarch is an ancient symbol for early death, probably because its metamorphoses can be seen as symbolic transitions to another life. But here's a man for whom the symbol became real. My daughter's computer name was, was Panda, and she would get on the computer and communicate with friends. And so uh, even before she died, one of my head covers in golf, golf was a panda. And so I'd always think of Jenny when, when uh, I played golf and would take that cover off. The first monarch experience for me was a Sunday afternoon in August and beautiful in Omaha. And uh, gathered my three wood out in the fairway and the head cover was the panda thinking about Jenny and looked down to my ball and there's a monarch sitting on the ball. And that monarch just sat there. And I said, there, there's, there's no way I'm, I'm going to hit that ball. So after several minutes, finally the monarch very gently and kind of spiraled up and went away. And, and I felt very warm about it, told my wife, and, and uh, within a couple of weeks, some more began to happen. I was talking to a new next door neighbor, and he asked me, how many children do you have? And I'm always reluctant, do I say three, including Jenny, or two, just the living? And I said three. And so he asked me questions. He says, I know a little bit about that and, and uh, what happened. So I told him, and then I began to relate the butterfly stories, uh, three of which had already happened at that point. I take my hat off and I'm shushing it away. Thing just doesn't want to go away. And as I'm, I'm talking about Jenny, as I'm talking about deathbed away, visions and so on, a monarch comes and there's a twig there and sits there. And he's doing this double take looking at me and looking at the monarch. And it sits there what seems like uh, six to seven minutes. And so for me, I don't know what they prove or whatever other than I take them for what they are and that, that somehow my daughter is still in my life. Somehow his daughter is still in his life. But in what, in what sense? Is she in some way present in the butterfly? Or do we really mean in his memory? Does this have something to teach us about what happens after death? Certainly many parents think so, and then there are the students and the researchers in the field of children and dying who frequently encounter stories of deceased children who come back to help their loved ones. I interviewed a man who had a little girl who had spent 18 months dying of neuroblastoma, and she got through multiple remissions. How's your day? Okay. Did anybody come to visit? No. No? Can I get anything? No. Dad? Yeah? No, I've saved myself One day, times. she and her father were talking, and she was very concerned about what's going to happen. And she said, Daddy, do you know why I've got better three times? He said, no, honey, why? She said, because I have to prepare you for my death. And when I feel you're ready, then I'll die. And the day she died, she put her arms around her daddy's neck and said, Daddy, you've got to promise you won't do anything to hurt yourself. And he promised. But yet the pain and the anguish so great Three days later, he was seriously thinking of killing himself. But uh, he heard her distinctly say, Daddy, remember, you promised. And he said, even though the pain was bad after that, I never seriously contemplated committing suicide again. A hallucination? Maybe. But when people die, there's always an inexplicable aura around them and never is that phenomenon more deeply felt than when a child dies. The feeling may come from the child, but it encompasses all the people close at hand. There's no end of credible anecdotal evidence to this effect. But Emily Dickinson 
puts it as clearly as anyone ever has. The last night that she lived, it was a common night, except the dying. This to us made nature different. We noticed smallest things, things or looked before, by this great light upon our minds, italicized, as it were. You know, something that Dr. Morse has learned from his research is that children don't see death as something to be feared. I'm curious. One child said to me, I'm not afraid to die anymore. What's the message that people who've had these experiences, that they tell us again and again, I'm no longer afraid to die. Sometimes children carry their indifference to death to extremes, appearing notoriously casual, not to say callous about the whole idea. After all, they can't really conceive of its meaning, and certainly not to its happening to them. Lucy had a baby, she named it Tiny Tim. She put it in the bathtub to see if it could swim. It drank up all the water, it ate up all the soap. It died the very next morning with bottles in its throat. Lucy had a baby, she named it Tiny Tim. She put it in the bathtub to see if it could swim. It drank up all the water, it ate up all the soap. It tried to eat the bathtub, but it wouldn't go down so Lucy had a baby. <laughs> But children not only have near-death experiences, they die too. And there's plenty of evidence that they tend to approach their deaths differently than adults. They are often less frightened and more concerned with the effects on their loved ones. Tanya Karwana had been battling leukemia for close to three years when her parents had to break the news to her that she wasn't going to get any better. When her cancer did come back, it was it was it was really it was devastating, and that to think that your child is is going to die and you're never going to see that child again, Tanya became very quiet, very withdrawn at that point. I knew that I couldn't wait any longer; that I had to confirm to her that yes, there's nothing more that could be done, and that was a very difficult thing as a mother to do, to look here. 13 year old child in the face and tell them that there's nothing more that can be done for them. Shortly afterwards, um, I went down to take a break and have a really good cry for myself. And when I came, I came back up, she wasn't in her room. And I found her in a little five year old boy's room telling him how important it is that he takes his medication because he was having a lot of problems taking his medication. And I thought, here's this child that just found out that she's dying, and here she is trying to help somebody else. When children are dying of an illness, it's a devastating event for parents, obviously, and siblings. But if the parent can make themselves receptive to the child really, truly sharing their experience, rather than continue to be rooted in the physical losses and changes, and that's a very hard thing to do, Anti anticipating the loss of a child is it's one of life's most devastating things but you have this little child this little this little spirit that is having some very wonderful experiences she was very weak and you could see her just trying to lift her arms and at first we couldn't figure out what she was trying to do and then we realized through her whispers that she was trying to hug us so we both took an arm, my husband took an arm, and I took on an arm, and I was, I was laying on the bed beside her, and then I put my other arm around her, and I was just holding her, and she kept saying over and over again, I love you, I love you. She knew that her time had come. If the parents can be more receptive to where the child truly is, not so much where the child's body is, it's a big distinction they will get some very comforting messages that this child is not alone, this child is going on a wonderful adventure, this child is not afraid, this child is not suffering. These are all things that will give them tremendous grief uh, assistance.
in, in, the, in the journey that they have up ahead. A tremendous amount of peace. Actually, the, the 10 minutes before she was dying, at the, at the very end, her breaths got quieter and quieter, and she stopped breathing. And at that point, I started crying. And she started breathing again. It was like she was trying to make herself go on for my sake. And I told her, I said, no, Tanya, no, it's okay, it's okay. And at that point, she stopped breathing. And then that was it for her. Tanya's love for her family and her lack of fear in the face of her impending death taught everyone around her a profound lesson in courage. The stories of children who have had near-death experiences and what those who were close to children who have died tell us confirms to me my sense that they're nearer to the womb of creation. And perhaps, in some sense, they're privy to a clearer and purer perception of what's happening to them. As Maggie Callanan tells us, if we can get beyond the grief and the pain we feel as a child close to us is dying, we might hear them telling us something very important about the journey they see ahead, that it's an adventure, that they're not afraid, and that we shouldn't be either.